Father Cashin was invited to St. Benedict's Abbey in Still River, Massachusetts in the early October 2013 to give a series of conferences on praying without ceasing, drawing on scripture, the liturgy, and the fathers, Father Cashin gives us some tips on how to pray better. In this day and age, we want quick fixes and easy answers, but we can only learn to pray better by doing it more frequently, and this takes time. Father Cashin is the founder and prior of the Monastery of San Benedetto, located at the birthplace of St. Benedict in Norcia, Italy. Father Cashin has remained on faculty at the Pontifical Liturgical Institute in Rome, and since 2010, has been a consultant to the Congregation of Divine Worship and the Discipline of the Sacraments. Father Cashin became a Benedictine monk at St. Mindred in southern Indiana in 1980 and was ordained a priest in 1984. He earned his doctorate in sacred liturgy from Sant'Anselmo in 1989. He has given retreats and talks throughout his life as a monk. Here is part four of Father Cashin's 10-part series on prayer. This talk focuses on Lectio Divina. Let us pray. Father of the eternal word, who spoke that word to us in the incarnation of your only begotten Son, open our hearts now to hear your word and grant us the grace to put it into practice. This we ask through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In Italian they talk about the filo rosso, the unifying thread of a, of a discourse or of a, any sort of writing. And the unifying thread of these conferences, uh, it's good to repeat from time to time, is prayer without ceasing. One of the kinds of explicit prayer which St. Benedict devotes a great deal of time in the daily schedule, and of course, if he gives it a lot of time, it means it's important, is Lexio Divina, as a way of praying without ceasing. Uh, let's do something rather concrete. Uh, just see in uh, chapter 48 how much time St. Benedict dedicates to this throughout the year. Uh, chapter 48 is on the daily manual labor, but he he lays out the schedule between um, the Liturgy of the Hours and uh, work and Lectio. He distinguishes three times of year from Easter, three different schedules, from Easter to October, from October to Lent, and from Lent to Easter. Let's see how much Lectio time is given to those three seasons of the year. Verse 4 says, uh, from Easter to the 1st of October, from the 4th hour, so that would be around 10 o'clock, until the time of sext, they will devote themselves to reading. So that's about two hours in the schedule. Then from October to Lent, the brothers ought to devote themselves to reading until the end of the second hour. So that's two full hours also, but not later in the morning, but right in the beginning of the day. So two hours once again. Now, of course, for St. Benedict, an hour isn't necessarily 60 minutes. It, it uh, depends on the sun and the time of year. So it could be between 45 minutes and an hour and 15 minutes, depending on the time of year. But let's standardize things for our own purposes. Uh, so, so far we have two hours uh, from Easter to October. From October to Lent, two hours also. Uh, but during the days of Lent, they should be free in the morning to read until the third hour, tertia plena, until the end of the third hour, which means three hours. So most of the year, two hours, but during Lent, three hours. And on Sunday, All are to be engaged in reading, except those who have been assigned various duties. So they have the whole day, theoretically, for Lectio Divina. However, as you might imagine, uh, 
Lexio is something difficult. In fact, Cashin lists it among the ascetical practices like vigils and fasting. So it's, uh, it's not like picking up a novel and reading for pleasure. It's, uh, it's a whole different uh, quality to it. And because it's difficult, he says in chapter 48, one or two seniors must be deputed to make the rounds of the monastery while the brothers are reading. Their duty is to see that no brother is so apathetic as to waste time or engage in idle talk to the neglect of his reading, and so not only harm himself, but also distract others. Now, this is, um, probably we're talking about a scriptorium kind of situation where all the monks are together, um, and they're supposed to be doing their reading, but, you know, you want to talk to your brother or tell a joke over here or get up and walk around because you're stiff, or, and uh, pretty soon uh, nobody's reading anymore. Now, if reading were something easy, you wouldn't need people to go around and check. So, it's something difficult. Strangely enough, uh, St. Benedict doesn't, doesn't tell us what we're supposed to do in these two hours. Uh, what, in what does this Lexio Divina consist? Uh, now, before we go into that, I have to confess uh, personally that I've never been very good at this form of prayer. As novices, we weren't really formed in it. It was presumed that we'd figure it out ourselves, but I don't remember ever uh, anybody teaching us uh, about Lexio Divina. And also, since one of the important elements of Lexio is memory, um, it's best to get into the habit while you're young. Now I'm too old and the memory isn't what it used to be, but for those who are young, I can only urge you to develop the skills before it's too late. When I was a novice, when I was a novice, <laughs> um, we used the Grail Psalter in English at St. Meinrad, and I pretty much had that memorized. Um, but now I use the Vulgate Psalter, and so uh, it's too late for me to memorize the Vulgate Psalter, at least parts of it have memorized, but I can't do the whole thing because I'm just too old now. And the head's not like it used to be. So anyway, especially, uh, Brandon, use your memory now. It's fresh and vigorous and good. Okay, if St. Benedict doesn't describe the method of Lexia Divina, who does? Where can we go to find out? And as you know, um, one of the followers of St. Bruno in the uh, Grand Chartreuse, Guigo II, uh, he wrote a little treatise called The Ladder of Monks, in which he describes the process of Lexio Divina. Let me just read the introduction of this uh, so you can get a feel for it. One day, when I was busy working with my hands, I began to think about our spiritual work, and all at once, four stages in spiritual exercise came into my mind. <coughs> Lexio, Meditatio, Oratio, and Contemplatio. These make a ladder for monks, by which they are lifted up from earth to heaven. It has few rungs, only four, yet its length is immense and wonderful, for its lower end rests upon the earth, but its top pierces the clouds and touches heavenly secrets. That's the image of the ladder. Uh, now, what are these four stages? He summarizes it this way. Reading, as it were, puts food whole into the mouth. Meditation chews it and breaks it up. Prayer extracts its flavor. Contemplation is the sweetness itself which gladdens and refreshes it. Now he'll use another analogy. Reading works on the outside, meditation on the pith, that is on the inside. Prayer asks for what we long for. Contemplation gives us delight in the sweetness which we have found. The rest of the treatise gives examples to describe those four moments of reading, meditation, uh, prayer, oratio, and contemplation. Let's uh, spend a little bit of time on these four uh, stages. 
First of all, reading. Uh, it's very hard for us to um, enter into the mind of the ancients, but the, the ancients read out loud, not to themselves. And there's a wonderful uh, passage in Augustine's Confessions in which he describes uh, an experience with St. Ambrose up in Milano. Uh, Augustine was not yet baptized. He was fascinated by Ambrose. He loved uh, hearing his preaching, uh, and he wanted to be around him as much as he could. So every now and then he would go to visit him. But he says, I could not ask of him what I wished, for I was kept from any face-to-face -face conversation with him by the throng of men with their own troubles whose infirmities he served. Ambrose was very bishop. He was very bishop was very busy as a bishop. He didn't have time to, uh, to spend with Augustine as Augustine would have liked. The very, the very little time he was not with these, he was refreshing either his body with necessary food or his mind with reading. When he read, his eyes traveled across the page and his heart sought into the sense, but strangely enough, he doesn't say that, but I'm saying that. But voice and tongue were silent. No one was forbidden to approach him, nor was it his custom to require that visitors should be announced. But when we came into him, into his uh, area, we often saw him reading and always to himself. And after we had sat long in silence, unwilling to interrupt a work on which he was so intent, we would depart again. We guessed, now this is Augustine's, uh, he's trying to understand this strange behavior on the part of St. Ambrose. We guessed that in the small time he could find for the refreshment of his mind, he would wish to be free from the distraction of other men's affairs and not called away from what he was doing. Here are two possible explanations for this strange behavior. Perhaps he was on guard, lest if he read aloud, Someone listening should be troubled and want an explanation if the author he was reading expressed some idea obscurely, and it might be necessary to expound or discuss some of the more difficult questions. And if he had to spend time on this, he could get through less reading than he wished. So he was reading to himself so that nobody would ask him questions. Second possibility. Or it may be that his real reason for reading to himself was to preserve his voice, which did in fact readily grow tired. Because he preached all the time, so his voice got hoarse. So to save his voice, he read to himself. But whatever his reason for doing it, that man certainly had a good reason. In other words, Augustine doesn't know why he read like that. It was just odd. Now, for us, it's not odd at all. We all read that way to ourselves. But the ancients read out loud. Uh, there's an indication of that in the rule of St. Benedict also. In chapter 48, the same chapter on um, the schedule, uh, during the summer season, uh, after sext and the meal, they may rest on their beds in complete silence, now, we're talking about dormitory living here, okay, so you got one bed next to the other. Should a brother wish to read privately, let him do so, but without disturbing the others. What does that mean? That he turns the pages too loudly or something? No, if, if, if the custom was to read out loud, then this brother would be sitting on his bed, or lying on his bed, or whatever, reading, and uh, Brother Paphnutius next door wants to sleep, and that's not going to work very well. Uh, so St. Benedict says, in that case, read to yourself, even though that's kind of an odd, it's not the normal practice. So uh, the whole discipline of Lexio Divina presupposes that we read out loud to ourselves. Now, um, people would probably think you mad um, 
when I sometimes, all, all too often, go through airports, sometimes nowadays with all these new gadgets people have, you see people standing there talking to themselves. I mean, they're not talking to anybody else, they're just talking, or even just gesticulating in Italian, and there's nobody there. You say, what's the matter with this person? Well, it's because the, he has the earphone, you know, in his, uh, in his ear, and he's actually talking with somebody. Um, but usually we talk, we don't talk to ourselves, unless you're mad, uh, you talk to someone. But in this case, we should be talking out loud to ourselves, or at least pronouncing the words out loud. Why is that? Because more senses are involved. If you pronounce the words, um, then your, your whole mouth is involved in making the, uh, shaping the words and making the sounds, and your ear hears the words, and so you're more engaged physically than if you're just reading with your eyes. <clears throat> now, I've known this for years and years and years, and I still have trouble reading out loud to myself because I'm so accustomed to reading silently, because we're trained from the time that we're this high to read quickly, uh, to, to grasp the, the, the sense uh, uh, in a synthetic way, and to read as much as possible in the short, shortest time possible, which is completely contrary to this older system. So that's the meditatio, uh, the lexio. The next stage <coughs> is meditatio. Now meditation, uh, in this context, as you know, is, has nothing to do with um, sitting in the lotus position and um, emptying your mind of everything except your mantra, which is what people usually think of when they think of meditating nowadays in our culture. But meditation for the ancients meant uh, repeating to yourself out loud for the sake of memorizing. And the image that they use is that of a cow chewing its cud. Or, depending on who the author is, they might talk about a camel chewing its cud, because in the Middle East, that's a little bit more common than the cow. And they're both the same kind of animal, I don't know what you call them, but several stomachs, and they have to <coughs> kind of process the food, and uh, they taste it a second time. Uh, so cows sit there, or stand there, in the field all day long, like that. And that's what we're supposed to be doing with the scriptures. Uh, ruminating over them, uh, reflecting over them, pondering over them, but a, in a concrete sort of way in order to memorize. Well, if that's what uh, meditation is, then we have a different idea uh, when we hear St. Benedict describe the novitiate in chapter 58. He describes the entrance uh, procedures, and then when the candidate is allowed to come in, he stays in the guest quarters for a few days. After that, he lives in the novitiate, where the novices... Hmm. The translation is, is really misleading. Where the novices study, eat, and sleep. I always thought, I'd love to be a novice again if that's what you do. <laughs> study, <laughs> eat, and sleep. You know, that'd be kind of nice. But the, uh, the Latin doesn't say that. It says where they meditate and eat and sleep. So what they're doing there is memorizing the Psalter or other parts of the scripture by repeating out loud to themselves. So that's the, the first two stages. Lexio, reading out loud to yourself. Meditatio, repeating the verse uh, that you have chosen uh, for the sake of memorizing it. The third stage is oratio, which, as we've seen uh, earlier, is personal prayer, uh, spontaneous prayer, in your own words, uh, the expression of your own sentiments to God, oftentimes based upon the words of the scripture that you've been ruminating over. <coughs> uh, now, one of the ways to do this in a more... Uh, to be a bit more concrete, is if you take um, a chapter of, this, of the scripture, read through the, through the chapter slowly until you find a verse that strikes your fancy. 
something that um, sticks out more than the other verses. When you, when you come across a verse like that, stop. Uh, then take that verse and try to memorize it and meditate on it, ruminate over it. And on the basis of that verse, then you formulate your own prayer to God. So it's quite personal, the whole procedure, because it's your prayer that comes from your own heart. That's the third stage. The fourth, contemplatio, is simply resting in God, uh, waiting to see if he has a response. That is, we've expressed ourselves to him, now we see if he answers back. Um, because this is supposed to be a dialogue, not a monologue. Uh, now, of course, God, God speaks in various ways, but oftentimes through intuitions or insights, or sometimes even by a verse of the scriptures that just happens to pop into your mind, you say, that's exactly what I needed to hear at this moment. Uh, in any case, the, 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 the last part is important, that is, give God a chance to, to uh, get in a word edgewise. Um, and so that takes a little bit of uh, stepping back and, and patience. Now, if the Lord doesn't uh, manifest himself to you, well, that's fine. And you just keep go. you go back and start repeating the thing from the beginning. Read on further, find another verse that strikes you uh, as important, meditate on that, formulate your own prayer to God, your own spontaneous prayer, and then wait for him to respond. Uh, some people are very good at spontaneous prayer, and some people are not. If that comes hard to you, then sometimes writing out your prayer is a good exercise. You can just write it down, and that helps you to formulate it more clearly for yourself. So that's the, the method that's uh, described by Guigo, the, the Carthusian. It's very um, down-to-earth and simple and practical and accessible to anyone, as long as they know how to read, but that's part of the whole monastic culture, that St. Benedict insists that the monks learn how to read, even if they don't know when they come in. And that's the basis of, of monastic culture, uh, and libraries and all sorts of things. But most of us learn how to read uh, when we're small, uh, so um, we can read the scriptures without too much trouble. <clears throat> there are a number of obstacles to um, this form of prayer. One is, even if we've got it in the, in the monastic schedule, we tend to nibble away at the assigned time. Um, suppose uh, between you know, theoretical horarium, between the Vespers and Supper, there's a half an hour for, for Lexio. Okay, by the time you get back to your cell, there's five minutes gone. Then you have to kind of straighten things out, and then your, your uh, attention is attracted by something on your desk, and by the time you actually get yourself ready for prayer, maybe seven minutes have gone by, and so on. So the time can get nibbled away. But even when the time is protected, there are many temptations to distraction. The text I'm reading perhaps seems tedious and uh, devoid of spiritual fruit. What if you're reading in um, the book of Leviticus, for example? Well, sometimes it gets a bit tedious. Or perhaps I'm just tired today. Perhaps I'm hungry and I'm thinking of supper that's coming around the corner. Or perhaps I have a headache so I can't concentrate. Or maybe there's this project that I really need to think about because I need to do that tomorrow. Or perhaps Brother so-and-so just spoke to me harshly, and I'm a little bit preoccupied about that. And so all these things are going on in my head, and that, that prevents me from, from focusing on Lexio Divina. Well, there are a few, uh, a few things that, that can help. So here are some, here are some suggestions. Uh, this first one is something that has worked for me very well over the years. Um, in 1952, the liturgical press uh, published a little uh, pamphlet 
called Daily Bible Reading with the Church, in which the Bible is divided into chapters in a three-year cycle. So you can read the entire New Testament in one year by reading one chapter a day, and the entire Old Testament in two years, one chapter a day. Um, I've used this uh, over and over again over the years. Sometimes uh, I put it aside and then read something else, but I always come back to this. And the reason for that is this is a, a kind of objective guide. Um, it uh, is bigger than your personal sentiments at the moment. But that is whether you feel like reading in the prophet Jeremiah today or not. Uh, it's kind of an assignment. And I happen to work good with assignments, and so that's why it's useful to me. Not everybody does. Uh, but uh, you follow this, this uh, guide, and you have one chapter a day. Well, most of us can manage that. It's not too difficult. And I, I have a copy here, to, if you want to make a photocopy or something later on. And if you have this one chapter, then that can be your Lexio project for the day. Not that you memorize a whole chapter, my goodness, I couldn't do that, but you can memorize one verse. When I was novice master, I asked the, the novices to follow this uh, program for Lexio and to write on a 3 by 5 card the one verse from that chapter that they were going to meditate on during the day. And they could put it in their pocket and carry it around with them, and if they forgot but they were memorizing, they can take out the card and work on it again, so that during the day, this one verse would still be something that was constantly in their, in their mind. So that, uh, that kind of device can be very useful to us. So I, I really like this, uh, this guide. Now, we talked a little bit about uh, uh, prayer with the gestures, as uh, one of the ways that the ancients uh, kept their prayer going throughout the day. And we might begin our Lexio period with, with uh, a few genuflections, a few metonies. I'll talk more about that uh, tomorrow. One thing that we really need to practice is reading out loud. Um, as I say, I always I have good intentions for doing that, but I always forget because I'm, it's just, uh, it's too foreign for me. Then it's very useful to formulate your prayer out loud too, not just in your thoughts, but actually verbalize it. Um, our, our thoughts are, are simply too, um, they, they just, uh, you can't latch onto them. They come and go, they're, they're too fast. Uh, so if you just think a prayer, well, you maybe really haven't, um, haven't entered into it fully. If you say it, then it's going to take a bit more effort, and it'll probably be a better prayer. I'm sure there are other things that you all can come up with too, that is little uh, tricks of the trade to help you to focus on, on Lexio Divina. I thought what I might do is to um, uh, give an example of Lexio Divina using the, the story from Luke's Gospel of the disciples on the road to Emmaus. Now, this is a little bit artificial because uh, Lexio Divina is a very, it's a very personal thing, and each person, the Lexio might be standard for everybody. Uh, the Meditatio is going to be different depending on what, what scripture verse you choose to meditate on. But the oratio comes from you. So I can offer some prayers of my own on these texts, but that might be quite different from your prayers. So that's why I say it's a little bit, uh, a little bit artificial. And also the fourth stage, the, the contemplatio, that means that you stop and, and listen to our Lord. And that takes time. Uh, and in this example, I'm not going to stop after each verse and, and uh, wait for the Lord to respond because we'd be here until 3.30 instead of 3.15. And we have to keep our, our, um, our time schedule. Anyway, let's try this and see what happens. And, and you can um, 
see how it, how it corresponds to your experience also. So this, be, uh, this story begins in ch verse 13 of chapter 24. And it's all very familiar to all of us. <clears throat> that very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. Okay, if I read that, I wouldn't find anything particular to meditate on. It's just kind of setting the scene, you know. And talking with each other about all these things that had happened. What are all these things? Well, the crucifixion, and the death, and the burial, and rumors of the body going missing from the tomb. So that's the that's presented to me as all these things for me to think about and to ponder. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. Now I might stop there and formulate a to med meditate on the verse, try to memorize the verse. Uh, Jesus drew near and went with them and formulate my own prayer. Draw near to us, O Lord, as we journey onward. Accompany us, come with us. Do not abandon us, for we are in great need of your mercy. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. I might pray this way, my eyes are often kept from recognizing you, O Lord. I can't see. I look, I search, but I don't find. My eyes are kept from recognizing you. By faith I know you are there, but by sight I know nothing. Heal my eyes as you did the man born blind, for unless you heal me, I cannot see you. Or something like that. Their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What is this conversation which you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, they stood still looking sad. Now I might uh, ponder on that phrase, uh, looking sad. Why are you sad, my soul? Why groan within me? Hope in God, I will praise him still my Savior and my God. Frequently enough, if we're steeped in the scriptures, our prayer, the prayer that comes to us, is the prayer of the scripture, because the word, God gives us the words, he teaches us the words in which we can pray to him. So just the, the one word sad here, uh, put into my mind, the psalm, uh, why are you, which in the old rite is part of the prayers at the foot of the altar, Quare triste says anima mea. Why are you sad? And one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? Are you the only one who doesn't know? God, you are supposed to know all things, and yet you pretend not to know. You know all things, yet you pretend not to know. You wish to teach me by this method, to lead me to greater insight. But I conclude that you don't know, and have turned away from me, leaving me to my own devices. And the stranger said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. So we, we can ponder on what people think about Jesus of Nazareth. Lord, we list all the things that we think about you, that you are a prophet, mighty in deed and word, 
for God and the people. We have such high expectations of you. But we see that the world puts you to death. And your body, the church, is being put to death all day long in many parts of the world. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. How we had hoped that finally God would stoop from his heavens and look down and see our misery and send us a savior, the one who would redeem Israel. We had hoped for liberty from oppression, for mighty deeds of divine power. And what did we get instead? The liberator overcome, the powerful one made weak, the mighty one humiliated, the immortal one crucified, died and buried. We had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel, but our hopes have been crushed. Some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning and did not find his body. And they came back seeing they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Can this be? Surely not. We're practical men. Someone came and stole the body. How much more disappointment can we take? This is too cruel, and our heart cannot bear it. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish men, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? How is it that this stranger unveils the meaning of the scriptures? Is it indeed, as you say, that the Christ should suffer? Our master said strange things like that too, but we didn't want to hear it. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He appeared to be going further, but they constrained him, saying, Stay with us, mane nobiscum, for it is toward evening. And the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. Stay with us, O Lord. Stay, abide, remain. Do not leave me. Do not go away. Do not abandon your servant. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished out of their sight. Their eyes were opened and they recognized him. Christ risen from the dead. Do I recognize you, O Lord, in your presence day to day? Open my eyes that I might see. They said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road? Our hearts are often cold, O Lord, and need more fire. 
with your presence that our hearts burn, not for any other created thing, but for you alone. So they returned to Jerusalem and told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. Well, uh, as I say, Lexio is something rather personal. And uh, St. Benedict will talk about uh, prayer with tears, and I'll say more about that tomorrow. Um, I can't read this passage. read it without weeping. If we read the scriptures like this, then we would get great spiritual nourishment. And I think we need to recover Lexio Divina as a fundamental pillar of Benedictine spirituality and as an important component for this prayer without ceasing. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As, As it was in the beginning, it is now, and it shall be, world without end. Amen.